Yes, welcome. This is Effa Rap Critic. I'm your boy Malik16. And no, I ain't never been a hater player nor a player hater. And uh, today I'm joined by a very special guest. This is going to be one of those super special episodes. And with no further ado, I'm going to let him introduce himself. Who you be? Peace, peace. What up, y'all? It's your boy Dylan. Put the name on the shirt. That way you don't forget it. See how it's spelled. <laughs> Repping full play. Straight out of ATL, Atlanta, Georgia. You know what I mean? It's an honor to be here. I rap. I make beats. I DJ. I cook food. Sometimes all at the same time. <laughs> Let's get busy, I baby. <laughs> I love it. So you saw the album that you clicked on in the thumbnail for. Today we're covering Black Star's uh, debut album. I mean, that's the album by the same name, the full name being Most Deaf and Talib Kweli R dot 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 Black Star. And uh, this is the year that this album turns 25 years old. So we're going to go over category two in this particular edition where we're going over the rap performance on that album and uh we're gonna switch things and shake things up a little bit uh just because like i told you this is one of those special episodes so dylan uh you know last time i had april walker on the, on the show and i asked her a question that i know your answer will be different to i asked her if she ever heard of hot ones if she ever saw that show and she's like no, I have no idea what that is. So you've seen Hot Ones, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, that's your jam, right? That's food and My music. My life is Hot Ones. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm going to bite a little. I'm going to bite a little from Sean and switch things up, because usually for episodes, we go solely focused on the album. But because you have a project coming out, and just because you and I share a few things uh, in common, man, uh, we're going to do it Sean style. And I'm going to ask you, uh, we're going to go back and forth between me asking you a Dylan question and a question about this album that we're talking about. And so my, my first Dylan question is, how did you get started musically? OK, well, um, musically, it, probably, it all kicked off really for me. Um, I dabble with stuff in, in college. I really started as, as a DJ first, like in like middle school. Like I, I had turntables. I'm born in 83. So, you know, back in the day, you had to have records and turntables to DJ. So DJing as a teenager was damn near impossible. I had to mow a lot of yards, couldn't keep up with it. So eventually just started rapping and stuff because it was free um, and really took it serious when I went to school. Uh, University of Florida, where I met like other like-minded individuals and artists. I grew up in Jacksonville, and, there, and no one in my neighborhood rapped or any anybody did anything musically. It was all about football and, and whatnot. And you know, I'm not fast, nor am I tall, but I can rap, baby. I figured that out. Um, so it was it was really in Gainesville in the scene there where I was uh, where I started writing my first songs and recording and i pressed up my first record um myself in like 2004 um and and it's kind of been downhill from there wow so I, so since i mean since you do this professionally i gotta ask you like a two-parter to that like when when would you say was the beginning of you starting to do this on a professional level like oh i'm officially in the business <laughs> Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I definitely felt like, like my, like my senior year in college and my, like right when I graduated, um, me and my man, Dirty Digits, we had, we had a nice little circuit in the Southeast cause he was at FSU and I was in Gainesville and Jacksonville. And, and so we were doing like a good amount of shows opening up for like everybody from people under the stairs to black delicious to live quality and matish yahoo when he first came out we were just like so it felt like we were like snowballing into something um and then we got booked to play the very first a3c in atlanta um and i came and, and did that and i got off the stage and the dudes that put that together was like yo if you move here we'll sign you to the label they had a label at the time before the a3c was a big festival it was actually just a little indie label like jam get down for a regional uh rap acts so it was really probably at that point in a long-winded way when, when i moved to atlanta right after i 
graduated and was like on this little indie label and we had like a little couple little mini tours and i was still working like waiting tables and, and whatnot but i i felt like i was in the biz you know what i mean like yeah i i'd say so like dude uh wait till we get down like to further questions like you just taught me something it's gonna all connect later like that's that's dope that's a dope story also man you you guys have never heard anybody more proud of the year they were born than Dylan, man. He, <laughs> you, you rep 80. I thought I was proud of 82, man. You are proud of that 83. It's in some of the branding on some of the merch. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, hey, baby, just going with the facts. Yeah, man, I love it. I love it. Uh, all right, so we're going to jump into the first dimension of this classic album review. And uh, the first dimension in category two that we talk about is the personality and charisma and so it's this is going to be interesting because it's a it's a two-person group it's a duo and they're not officially a group it's it's more like a a tag team mashup um, right they're joining forces and you got two different styles coming together right i i just discovered um and and i should have known this it makes sense discovering this that Talib was like an understudy or almost like a protege of Mr. Man from the Bush Babies. And ah. I used to really, really like the Bush Babies. And as we go through other dimensions, like it'll come into play why that makes sense. But like Mr. Man was, he had his own presentation in that group. He wasn't the most dynamic member of that group. Uh, but most is someone that I think his whole approach is dynamic. That is the word to describe most. It's a bombastic presence, right? Yeah, and it's a once in a generational type of character. He kind of transcended everything. He broke like every seal, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would raise the argument that most is the charisma presence on this album. And I, I think you definitely get an idea of, of Talib's. Uh, principles what he stands on what he what he wants to get across but i don't know how much personality and charisma is there what would you say i mean it's hard to disagree with that just because of what most brings to the table charismatically speaking um but i would say um it's just the way they play off each other it, it, it's just it's like magnetic poles you know what i mean it's like Talib didn't have to be as charismatic because most kind of filled up that space. Um, so he he was almost maybe more aggressive at times. But I again, brown skin lady, the lyrics are pretty charismatic as far as like his his like you know kicking game to 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 the shorty. You know what I mean? Uh, but it, yeah, you're right. I mean, he's probably comes off as maybe more, a little more aggressive, a little more like got something to prove. Where most is kind of like the the sage, like don't know where he's gonna go next, whimsical type. You know what I mean? Yeah, I've never heard. I've never heard that description. Talib has a more of a, more of aggression to him, and most is the more laid back, uh, kind of cool, calm, confident. I, I agree with everything you said. I think with with Talib, you you leave this album with an idea of what he cares about he definitely gets that across this is he's actually kind of feeling a lot of the cliches at the time before maybe in the last year before they became really cliche i mean he's saying you know things like free mumia and things that right. were popular to say if you were woke back then right uh, he's he's hitting all those points and if you were I mean, he embodied a, that he embodied yeah. that he kind of crossed it over into like into the into the hip-hop you know, mainstream underground or whatever, for sure. I mean, they, they represented that. Yeah, on one level, he's doing all, all of that and he's doing all the cliche underground rap things. Like, I think he he has a line where he says something like lyrical fitness, man. If I had a dime for every time I've heard <laughs> lyrical fitness rhyme with witness or something, you know, so he's, he, like I said, it's probably the last year before, you know, you get eye rolls if you say some of the stuff that's out there. Totally. He, you you leave here knowing this is what these are his kind of his two agendas really like I want you to know that I'm pro black 
and I'm an underground rapper and I love underground rap. With most, right. you, you use the word, you said whimsical, you don't know where he's gonna go next because he'll hit you with a poetic verse, then he'll hit you with a real Brooklyn verse, then he might sing the next one. You know? right, right, right. So yeah, on the, on the scale from one to five, five being the highest, what would you give uh, them as a duo for how much personality they and charisma they had on this album? And don't be nice. <laughs> They're 3.5. There we go, 3.5, I got you. All right, so another Dylan question. Uh, just like I asked you how you started with music, man, how'd you start with food? Oh, okay, yeah, so I was at University of Florida um, and I was waiting tables at this restaurant, a Japanese steakhouse, and they got robbed and all the chefs quit. And I was like 17. I had braces. I had, I had orange and blue, like gator color braces, dog. Woo! Uh, and so the owner, he didn't speak a lick of English. And he was like, basically, if you stay here, I'll teach you how to be a hibachi chef. And I was like, fuck it, let's go. So I cooked every day. This shit was like Karate Kid, I swear to God. Every day I went to this hibachi restaurant and I was cooking on the grill and I had to eat my pay was eating what I cooked. And that's and so that's what I did for like eight weeks. And then I was a hibachi chef all through college. And like full time, I just was in that life. And then I'm, that's how I met Chuck D. <laughs> he came to my restaurant and I cooked him salmon and scallops and I made him some sushi. We've been friends forever. <laughs> that's, that's how it happened. Dude, th that story is crazier than <laughs> than your rap journey. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, were there any like licenses, or certifications you had to get? I mean, of course, you got to get your food handlers, but I mean, did you get? Yeah, any, just like basic, basic stuff like that. It was just the approval of of the other chefs being even allowed to be to rock with them and and being able to play poker with them after them. That was that's how I knew I, that was my certification. <laughs> that's crazy and so from there you've taken that skill set and kind of just been self-taught and everything else yeah and, and i've always i waited tables and, and i've always kind of i've always been obsessed with eating um and first and then learning how to cook uh because i was broke so make like the best shit the cheapest possible and then just kind of it's like my it's like i don't know it's like my it's therapy honestly Cutting vegetables, prepping, cause that's like, that's my therapy, straight up. Damn, what a story, man. <laughs> what a story. All right, we're going to jump into the second dimension of the album review. This is right. suspension of disbelief or believability factor. So uh, I think it's safe to say this is not an album where you're supposed to suspend your disbelief. They're not going into any characters or right. know, assuming any identity. So the question is always, how much do most Def and Tyler Kuali make us believe them on this album? Oh, dude. I mean, for me, growing up in Jacksonville, Florida, and I was, what, 15? I was in 10th grade when this came out. I remember vividly borrowing the CD from my boy Craig Washington so I could try and burn it. Because, you know, CDs were like $23, B. So, bruh, I, I think incredibly believable and i think that was kind of their brand was like actual factual you know what i mean like portrayal of everything uh life in brooklyn uh being black in america especially to me who someone i wasn't in brooklyn i wasn't like there to experience anything other than what their portrayal was and i was like yo this shit sounds this is like New York as it gets to, to me yeah. at the time. A big strength of this album is that they know their lane. Because they knew that lane, they were proud of it. There's no outlandish claims. There's no over the top. Because they're staying in their lane, there's no real room to be like, oh, they're faking. Like, uh, even, you know, I've, I've found, I brought this up before in, in other episodes. We don't talk about it enough how. You, you, there was a wave of fake conscious rappers where you know they totally do stuff right. that contradicts their entire message but at this point in time them they it was easy to believe that they embodied everything they were saying and listening sure. back to it 
going to listen to it in preparation for this episode with, with you know new ears i didn't realize how like almost militant talib was i'm like most he made most seem like the the calm one <laughs> like right. you said he was a little aggressive i'm like oh every right. song you're gonna put a pro-black message in it sometimes most is like hey i just want to rap about him seeing and, and women <laughs> right <laughs> but is like yeah let me make this reference to marcus garvey let me make this reference to right you know, so but yeah never once do i think they do anything on this microphone that is unbelievable so. Even children's story, which is meant to be a story and meant to be a parody, is still like based in like it's a factual take. Oh yeah, I was gonna point this out when we were talking about personality. Like even in Brown Skin Lady, Talib starts one of his verses and he's like, I don't give many compliments, but I am confident. I'm like, oh that that's a vulnerable moment there. Most rappers right. Total opposite, right? I knock them down. I, you know, like right. I, I that, used to have a complex about getting too complex. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what? What men do you hear saying that on the mic? So I, that line Look always out. stood out. It, it always stood out. So on a scale from one to five, what would you give this for uh, believability? Five. Big five. Easy. Big Easy. Five. <laughs> All right. Jump into another Dylan question. Dylan, man, you you have a an album based on plants? <laughs> Am I wow. understanding that correctly? <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. So, um, you know, I said I love to eat, um, but, you know, cooking's cheaper. Well, I love to cook, but growing food is cheaper than buying that shit. So, <laughs> so I got, I've got. i always tried to keep a garden. Um, I moved this year, so I didn't get to. Uh, but yeah, for like the past 10 years, and that's another part of my therapy. Love it, just being out there with the veggies and the herbs. Um, so I have a instrumental series, like a beat tape series called Guard Instrumentals. Um, and I released two volumes of those. Um, yeah, it's music to garden to. And it's just like, you know, I guess, it's, it's like lo-fi, that's what they call it now, but that's always the shit we've always been making was lo-fi, that's just what we made, and now they just call it that, but, so it's, it sounds like that to me, um, ish. Oh, and check this out. With the last, uh -huh. with the last tape, I did a flower pot, and it, it comes with dirt, and I flipped the full plate logo to a full plant, you know what yes. I mean? And it came with seeds, and you could. It came with like basil seeds, so you could grow some basil with the tape. Dude, that's that's exactly why I brought it up because I'm like the marketing is always creative. We'll probably have a whole convo about how you market your stuff because I think there's there's a brilliance there, and and like something tells me you probably didn't take classes from that. There's probably a lot of trial and error, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, like just desperation, just every <laughs> every attempt is a last gasp. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, that's wild man i love that yo i don't know if you've ever seen anybody sell you music with a flower pot <laughs> and everything you need to get get it going a brand new I hope flower I'm the pot. First. yeah yo all right so dimension three this is where we get into the nitty-gritty the delivery all right yeah. we talked we talked about most and talib have two different styles two different personalities but this is all about how they use their voices on the mic. It also maybe speaks on their techniques a little bit, just because Moses' voice is kind of already like more of a soothing kind of like just his voice palette, you know what I mean? And then he's already singing and like kind of bringing that to the table. And then Talib, you know, he's a he's a lyricist, words, lots of words. He jams them all in. He's Come and ask you like an attack dog with just he's fitting everything that he can fit in and then some even if there's some shit that don't fit in he's gonna make it work so i feel like that's him just trying to like or not trying but just his vocabulary his is just the amount his verboseness you know shout out to beef shout out to the homie beef beef will get on me when he if he ever sees this episode because he's a little biased because he's talib's homie but uh I've, I've always had gripes with Talib's delivery. But just for the sake of talking about this album and the delivery on here, I think where Talib has a lot, we'll talk about it more in the flow category, his delivery is probably his Achilles heel. 
Um, you mentioned before how verbose he is, right? And so there is, with this aggressiveness and with this verboseness, it's usually a recipe for disaster if it's not controlled. As a rapper, you can be as wordy as you want as long as you got control. Keep that dog on a leash. And I think what we'll see on more songs than not is that Talib sounds like he may not have control because he gets overexcited. Um, and I don't know, this style must have been really short lived in New York for a minute, but I remember in the underground, this style had become popular because I think people were going to stuff like Lyricist Lounge, and, yeah. you know, these Nia Rican Poets Cafe. And, and I'm among that. I, I used to do that. And it was this moment in time where this trend of progressive excitement in your verses was like yeah. the go to style. You'll hear Wordsworth do that same style. There was like, you must know karate to think your body's bulletproof like Sade, like you're going up yeah. <laughs> diagonally, right? Where ironically, this is the same year where the conversational trend became popular in mainstream uh, hip hop for like the street rappers where they would have like question marks on the end of their inflections. Like I remember right. telling someone that Cameron's flow and delivery is the same as DMX's and Jada Kisses and Jay-Z, and they thought I was saying the craziest thing, but I'm like, uh, listen to the way that the inflections of their deliveries go, right? So like, if DMX is like, hey, yo, you low, da 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 and that's what Cameron was doing when he first came out. He's like, hey, yo, you know? Like, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? He's like, no. Right. That. that was the mainstream popular trend. That lasted for like a good two year run before people got tired of it. But on the underground, right that excited progressive tone and i'm like i think that's the thing in talib's delivery yeah has a little corniness to it to speak on that um back in the day rest in peace my partner peyton lock he used to call it uh the lilt l-i-l-t the lilt because oh, i used to do that shit because that was the style that was like the the you know <laughs> and I just gotta go. You know what I mean? But but now, you know, now it's like the understated. Now everything's like super duper understated with no drums and all that. So, you know, I don't mind a little energy. <laughs> I, knew you, I knew you were gonna be really diplomatic about it. And I try, you know, my thing here on this show, I try not to put my opinion in too much to try to create this to be as objective as possible. Like music is always gonna be subjective at the end of the day, but the purpose of this system is to try to have the most, you know, kind of fact-based analysis and standard, right? And so when I think about it, especially because you and I, you know, coming both from a rapper's mind, we understand how this shit goes. When you, when you put pen to paper, it's like, I wonder what made that sound okay. Cause it's never a style that, that was meant to last long on wax. I think it comes from a live performance aesthetic. That's how I was about to say that. I think it's just the physical, I think it's just the ciphers, dog. Like yeah. like the New York City ciphers, like in my mind, like that's what it was. Like everybody like embodying their lyrics and and with the physical performance aspect um, that doesn't translate to the record. You know what yeah. I mean? There's um, a lot of things you could do at a live show that you that that will go over just because you're in the moment, like freestyle. Sometimes when I freestyle, I say the simplest stuff, but we cry, because the crowd's like anticipating the next word, they're like, "Oh, yeah, right, right, right." You can and sell like, it. It's like ah, and I say the same thing in reverse. I think a lot of things, a lot of rappers could benefit from thinking about what they record, how it would sound performed live. But uh, yeah, it's just not as pleasing to the ear, and, and so I think a lot's like on Hater Players where Tyler was doing that line. He's like. Clarence Carter, Clarence Carter. And I was like, whoa, it sounded so sloppy and rushed. And I know it was the eagerness to get that line out. It's like, ooh, listen to this funny line. And I'm like, yeah. if we're in a cypher, saying it like that wouldn't matter because I'm reacting to how funny it is. But on wax, I just found it a little amateur, right? As opposed to most, most always has control. Yeah. Uh, even if he's doing the cheat code of like stacking a bunch of hollow rhymes back to back. I love that little thing that you just told me. You just taught me a new word, and I had no idea that Peyton Lock passed away. He's on a, a lot of your projects, so rest in peace. Yeah, thank you, bro. Yeah. Thank you. That's love. Yeah. But as far as most, what can we say about most is delivery? 
they just played off each other. It was just like a perfect dynamic that made it work. They made each other sound better. They made each other like kind of fit and kind of held each other in line. You know what I mean? Like most couldn't go too far because Lib was over here ready to pounce. It's how Lib couldn't get all of, all the words out because most is over here. You know, nah, B. I'm a I'm a go whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, I, I think yeah, like you know, Moses' delivery, it was g- groundbreaking, game changing. Yeah, because he, I, I mean, it's not, I can't go as far as to say there's no Drake without Moses, but like, there's no Drake without Fonte. That's a that's a different episode. Of, yeah. but, but most like opened up the lane for that kind of like that character in hip hop you know what I mean like there wasn't no nobody that that had that quite like that dog like yeah. be able to sing rap do the poetry most of shit was groundbreaking I yeah think. I think I think there's a freeness to most you know again I go yeah. back to the word you use that whimsy man he uh but there's a control like he's music pours through his spirit so even if he's doing the most simple basic staccato pattern it bounces like i think of what he did on brown skin lady right it, it's so simple it, but it it worked because he was married to the beat that woo, da, 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 right, da, yeah. da, 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 dude for the whole verse he didn't really deviate in his verse that was his whole Low pattern. Down. um and and the contrast of their vocal tones is what helps like that's it's, where they it's musical it was the musicality it was its own interest uh, their its own instrument you know, yeah. reminded me, uh, reminds me of like Camp Low, kind of. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you have like the grading tone, and then you got like the low tone, and they they both work real nice together. Yeah. And maybe not as even, you know, maybe you don't enjoy Talib solo work as much, or most of solo work as much. But when they're together, it's like rah rah. It's like necessary. You know what I mean? Like yeah. You could bounce off of Talib's higher pitch. He's definitely one of the most high pitch rappers <laughs> right. in, in the game. And in most with the, the chill, quiet, kind of mumble thing that he mm-hmm. has going on, right? Um, even though on this album, he does less of the mumbly thing. This album, he's boisterous throughout. You know? Yeah, you know, it, he was still kind of adhering to the MC code as much as possible. And I think they were like, cypher mode you know what I mean and then they ad lib over each other and I thought that was interesting there's some things where Tyler was really ad-lib with Mo, and most really adds um some texture to Talib stuff like uh knowledge of self-determination like that's Talib solo but you hear most on the hook and that helps yeah. bring some fullness out so yeah I mean delivery is is saved by the fact that most songs have them together I think um we, we would have to have that discussion on like Reflection Eternals album to see how Talib does on his own. But have you heard their their new their their new album, the one that came out last year, the, uh, No Fear Time? The one that's on Luminary. I've only heard the couple the couple singles that have leaked. I'm still waiting for. Uh, Me too. For, I'm right with you. Yeah. I think that, that's a lot of people. They got a, of, they got a lot of split reaction on that that decision, but. It sounds, from what I heard, it sounds like Talib has found his pocket. He, he now is a, is a calmer version of himself. He hits those lines right where they need to be, executes them, um, and there's a lot less cliche in what he says. So um, when we're thinking about delivery on this album, what are you giving this on a scale from one to five heartbeats? Delivery? Oof. Probably a 3.5 just because because there are probably more moments that seem forced um, from quality. And there might even be some moments where there might be a little a little too much singing for most for me, for my yeah. taste. A little too like not, not quite in key, just not quite perfect. Yes. Like, 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 I don't know. Yeah. Yo, 
I, I, <laughs> yo, you don't know how much I, I value your honesty on that because it needs to be said. Like we, again, we, we're speaking from a rapper's mind and as listeners, it's already a classic album, so it takes nothing away from yeah. it. But if we're letting facts be facts, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of songs that could have vamped out earlier. They were just kind of. Tali was talking too much at the end, and most was singing too much at the end. I'm like, this song could have went off a, a minute ago. So yeah, yeah, they were on the jazz man shit. With that. Yeah, they were yeah. In, the, you know, in the prime of that underground backpack. Hey, it was a really fun time. So I, yeah, I, no I, doubt, yeah. no doubt. <laughs> All right, so another Dylan question, probably the, the biggest question, uh, and 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 the reason I sought you out, bro. Plates and crates. <laughs> Dude, right now, I think alike. <laughs> so, I, I I just I realized this is the tenth anniversary of you celebrating full plate, and I, I want to kind of get into what full plate is. But it's the tenth anniversary of me establishing uh, plates and crates, and, and I'm like, wild, I feel like for, I feel like for years we have not known each other existed. So this is what I was telling you earlier. The backstory. I found out about you after my first time going down to A3C. And okay. uh, my first time going down there was 2017. And, you know, we were performing. Okay. We were performing. And I think at first I pitched to them because, you know, they always have this like other thing. It's, since it's a full festival now, um, I don't know where they're at with things now. Pandemic really rocked a lot of things. But yeah, they were. Uh, I was just trying to put my platform there, the plates and crates, and bring that event there, and they declined it. So I was like, I'll go as a, as a, as a rapper, <laughs> as an artist. So we were performing out there, and I, I think I saw like a flyer for something that said plates and crates. So I was like, who the hell is this? I'm out there <laughs> selling hats, I'm selling plates and crates, hats, I'm selling merch. So I'm like, that's wild. Dude, and so when I finally, uh, I had reached out to you like, maybe the year after, because I had just got a trademark and I was trying to buy the platesandcrates.com and that's bought by you. And I'm like, I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, <laughs> yo, before we talk about full play, can you tell me, oh, like, man. Where, <laughs> can you tell me where Plates and Grace come from, comes from for you? And I'll tell you where Plates and Grace comes from for me. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Uh, that's, that's wild, bro. That's crazy. Uh, that's love. I, I love it. Um, so, Place and Crates actually was an idea in my mind before Full Plate. Um, and it's always, I've had this idea of wanting to have a record store with snacks. Because um, I always want to eat when I date for records. So, it's always been my, like, my little thing. And because it wasn't, I wasn't able to really do it. I just started throwing these dinner parties at my house um, and I would have DJs coming out, spinning vinyl only. And at first they were selling the records they were playing. So they were just, whatever's on is for sale. And you're like, yo, I love that. Well, you can go buy it, it's right there. Um, but So that was like the crates aspect. And then, I, you know, I cook like a vegan, always a vegan, like five course, like fancy as hell dinner. And only vegan, so that no one can say no. <laughs> Not like I ain't trying to save the world or no nothing like that. I just I need everybody's money. So I thought I thought when I first saw that you were doing this thing where you were like rapping and cooking at the same time. Have you ever done I that? I do that too. I, I'm, I'm, they know me down here for my rap show for for cooking up some shit during the show. That's typically what I do. Now, the, the cool part about it is that I discovered that you existed with, with the name Plates and Crates around the same time that I was leaving New York. And so I, I moved out here to the Bay and I brought the event to the Bay. So I, I'll explain a little bit about where Plates and Crates originates for us. So me and my, my boy Fred, shout out to Mr. Hawkins. Uh, we started this event in 2013 and you know he'd been running around the city putting on these open mics. And I told him, I'm like, bro, you gotta stop this open mic stuff because it's just 48 rappers that just want to get on stage. And he was trying to do it like a variety show where there's a singer. I'm like, nobody's gonna want to hear the singer after they heard four rap crews come up. So I'm like, we gotta give it some context. I was like, listen, let's capitalize on two things. Uh, this is when the brunch movement had become a big deal in New York. I think it right. started in LA, but 
it, by the time it came to New York, everyone was doing it every week. And I was like, why don't we do brunch at night? And instead of just having random rap for the sake of it, or instead of me and you trying to rap, because I think that was probably my last year being a, a, a solo artist. Like my, my deal, it fell through. I had a deal with Universal. And I was like, F that, I'm going back to college because this ain't popping. And so I was like, nobody wants to hear rap from no name rappers. <laughs> so I was like, why don't we do this live band performance of a classic hip hop album, do a cover rap band. No one had been doing this in New York. This is before right. trap karaoke. This is before hip hop was really allowed in venues. So we would go around all these different clubs and restaurants in New York asking them to change their menu for one night to serve brunch and allow us to perform. And we were gonna dress in suit and ties just to prove to them that there'd be no shootings and nothing violent right, 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 at a right. hip hop show. That's how early it was. Like probably like the year and a half afterwards, it was hip hop everything. Trap, trap yoga, trap karaoke, trap right. cycle. But before <laughs> that, we were doing this and people were like, I don't know. And we had to like prove it. So we were getting residencies in different spots and it was a struggle to find the right place to do waffles and mimosas at night, but the nights where we would have it, man, we would have it. It would be so dope. Like probably our best night, we had Jerobi as our guest chef, and oh, um, we did a memorial I peeped day. That. Oh, you peeped that? Okay. Yeah, I peeped that. Yeah, that was probably one of the times that somebody hashtagged us, and I, I started to see your hashtags and then there, and then I think one of your people tagged you in one of our posts. Like, is this? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's a little bit of, of our that background. Sounds legendary, bro. bro. Dude, it's dude, I've been trying to like connect with you for a minute. So it, it went from like uh who is this to oh what he does is dope. How can we collaborate on that? So um that's yeah, so the events, I tried to do one in Atlanta. We were gonna do a Jeezy day, that one fell through. I brought a couple out here to Oakland. And uh after the pandemic, I just kind of put it to rest. I think I saw you you did some uh at home performance stuff during the pandemic. Yeah. I did some, so we we all just kind of, kind of found ways to pivot. And Trying to figure it out still, man. It's it's on hiatus. It's it's always for me. It's always going to be a house party because that's what people like love about it. That's what makes it special. Um, and I don't want to pack shit up and take it somewhere and then I forgot the damn soy sauce and my kosher yeah. salt and I gotta go back and like that. Stay at the crib where I can smoke <laughs> and be myself. Um but um it's on hiatus and um just got a new spot, a new crib so I'm trying to get it right and hopefully do do like a relaunch. Low yeah. key. Low, Low key. key are you you want to keep it low key. That breaks my heart, man, because I want no, to. Uh, a brick and mortar is the is the is the is the dream, bro. Like a okay. a record store and cafe eatery is the dream. So I invited you on because I wanted to officially like retire plates and crates and like let you have it. <laughs> so uh, this is the year that I'm giving up the plates and crates to focus more on this, the rap ruler system that I created here and this F a rap critic show. And I, I wanted to have you on just to be like, oh, we finally meet 10 years. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Right. That's so dope, man. That's wild, bro. Yeah, thank you for being a good sport, man. <laughs> oh, hey, likewise, thank you, bro. It's all love, man. Cool, cool. We'll jump back into Dimension 4, The Flow. And I love having other rappers on the show because you understand the difference between flow and delivery, and most people don't. So what can we say about the flow patterns on this album? Um, this is where it's going to be tricky for Talib because his flow is, is obviously, unless that's, again, you know, with context, it was kind of the lexicon of the time uh, to be kind of wordy. It was almost like a regional, like cipher specific type of technique that, you know what I mean? Like if there was another wordy dude that you had to out wordy that guy. And then that's, and that's how we got to this point. Yeah. But I mean, most is a chameleon and is able to do a lot of different flows. Um, and you can see he's kind of like cutting his teeth with that 
different flows like on children's stories kind of got the old school flow and then they got the b-boys will be b-boys where they kind of got like the classic kind of cadence um but if i had to score it i mean probably probably three yeah talib is is not i he probably that's probably where, where he might take away from it yeah i agree i think just, just in the categorically speaking yeah, just categorically speaking, in the, uh, you know, Talib is at his best when he's attempting a different flow. And he'll do it on, you know, like on definition, where he's Brooklyn, New York City, where they paint murals. Yeah. If he would have kept that cadence. Body that. Absolutely bought that. If he would have kept that cadence, it would have been great. But again, he did that thing that I was mentioning with his delivery, where he wants to stupid fifty cents. Yeah, yeah, it just kind of derails a little bit. Same thing with Brown Skin Lady, where he's like, pressing on the vegetables. If he would have kept that bouncy flow, but then he started going into his wordiness uh, and yeah. loses it a little bit. Not not too much, but there's other songs where he completely loses it. Like what I mentioned on Hater Players, I think on Twice in a Lifetime, he gets so excited by his verse that he kind of, you know, with the androgynous, misogynist. <laughs> yeah. kinda... oh, but uh, yeah, I mean, Wordsworth probably loses his flow the most on that song. So Talib doesn't stand out as, as bad as he would on his own track. But you, I think what Talib suffers from is not having a definitive um, structure to the flows. It's just wordiness yeah. and it's fitting where he can make it fit. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I pride myself on being able to kind of tell the rappers who are reading off paper and the rappers who have committed their verses to memory. There's right. more organic fluidity that's going to happen. And that's that's what Talib lacks. He's got wordiness, but he lacks the fluidity. Uh, most his voice doesn't lead you to believe that he's as wordy. They're probably using the same syllables. And like you said, because yeah. he tries so many different flow patterns and he's more prone to switch up flow patterns per like every four bars, right? Yeah, based um, on whatever words he's trying to use. It's not really, he's not forcing the words to, to work for him. He's kind of at the mercy of words that he uses and he's using the biggest, you know, words possible because that was, that was what the style was, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's not, he's not afraid to shout or abruptly stop the pattern in the middle of the verse to shift it or to make a statement. So, like, when I think about, he's doing the MC shit, right? He's like, accurate assassin shit, first to the last of it. But then he'll stop that randomly to go, we're Brooklyn. See that? About to take it all. Can't Man, believe that. That's the body, bro. Right, he just switched the whole flow. Style, bro. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he does that all throughout. The only track where he keeps the same pattern for an entire verse is Brown Skin Lady. And you can consider that kind of lazy. But even in that laziness, there's creativity. And that's such a different flow from anything else he uses on the album. It gets a pass. It's like, OK, I haven't heard him use this flow. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that most is definitely like the poet and Talib is the writer. And that's kind of like what they were. Yeah, you know, that was kind of like the brand. And that's why you that's why you wanted to fuck, fuck with that. Like that's what you, you wanted both sides of the shit. You know what I mean? Like that's that's kind of that's how I, I was my take on it looking back. Man, I haven't heard that ever uh distinguish better. Like I couldn't say that better myself. The poet and the writer. Yeah, because if you read Talib's verses as as prose as text. Oh, it all yeah, he, he yeah. was working in the bookstore. I believe his mother was a literature professor, if I'm not mistaken. He's, he, I mean, this is what his this is his pedigree. This is what he comes from. You know what I mean? Like, so it makes sense. Like, he, he's one of the architects and forefathers of that style. You think so? That's interesting. Well, I mean, as far <laughs> as that crossed over to be known for it. You know what I mean? Like oh, everybody knew absolutely. Talib as like the backpacker. Like he, like he was, he won. You know what I mean? Like yeah, like, yeah, like like that's what that's what he is. Like, you know You're like, right. You're right. He was not supposed to make it because it was like that style it snuck through and, and he's he is the name associated with that very, very underground style that you and I know a million rappers were doing on the scene, but right. because he made it, <laughs> he's the face of it, yeah. 
Wow, what a what a take, man. Um, you said a three for Flo on this one? Cool. Yeah. Cool. All right, another Dylan question. I mentioned it earlier. What is full plate and what's the difference between full plate and plates and crates? Okay, so um, basically I kicked the idea of, of plates and crates just as the, the record store concept or whatever uh, to my partner Peyton. And this was like around 2012, something like that. Um, 2010, maybe. I um, mean, we had like, that was just something I was kicking around. And then basically we got the rights back, the digital rights back to our first album together. It's an album called Studies in Hunger uh, that we originally released in 2009. Um, that's the one that had Chuck D on it. Uh, anyway, so we had, the, we had the rights back to it and we didn't know what to do. At this point, it's like 2012. And the, the, there wasn't no band camp. Like, it was kind of weird, like getting your shit on iTunes. Wasn't no streamers yet. So it was kind of like a, we nobody, you know, the record industry was dead. It was kind of like a no man's land. Like, what are we supposed to do? What do you mean we have this back? I don't want this. <laughs> like, so we basically had the idea. We were like, well, let's just put it, the shit out ourselves. And let's, we had always been kicking around the notion of like a, a label um, just because there was a handful of, we had a collective of artists. Um, I grew up in Jacksonville. That's Duval County. You hear the Jaguars, Duval. We've been saying that way before the football team, you know. Um, so we just already had like a collective of artists and we're like, let's start this label. Um, and then I think we were on the phone one day and I was like, man, I got to run around. I got too much. I can't talk to your ass. I got a full plate. And I was like, we we're, were both like mad at each other. And we're like, wait a minute. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it was kind of already, the, I was like, well, we got plates and crates. Um, so so full plate is kind of like the the umbrella, you know what I mean? And then like plates and crates is underneath it. Cause we, didn't, we don't say like full plate records. We just say full plate because it's, it's events. It could be anything. It could be a recipe. Uh, we, we do books. We do, you know, so it's, we didn't want to like be hindered to just records. Just kind of wanted it to be like open. Um, and even from from that, like um, Peyton started doing a DJ night with all 45s, you know, the l little plates, and he called it little plates. So it was like full plate presents little plates, and, and so he had little plates going on in Jacksonville, and I was doing plates and crates in Atlanta, and then sometimes we mix them up, and and it was all like full plate, and it, so that's just kind of where it where it kind of came from but, but it's mainly a record label you know we and we release vinyl rap records and beat tapes and some other weird shit <laughs> so dope so dope flower, flower pots which y'all need yeah. to go cop <laughs> got jazz books we got we got some we got some weird things yeah we, we get busy jazz books how the hell do you get into jazz books yeah you no know, my man uh bat sauce um, my man Bad Sauce, who's like architect, engineer, producer, you know, been down since day one. He um, is a art was an art teacher uh, for mad years. Was real nice with the drawing. And over the pandemic, he taught himself how to like really get busy on the Adobe Illustrator or whatever. Um, so he did a we we have a book out called Portraits and Jazz, and it's like 50 jazz illustrations, like iconic jazz portraits. That he like recreated and redrew and there's like a, like a little bullet point on each side like a quick bio uh notable albums um so yeah like shit like that and that's like almost in like an educational space like i gave one to sky zoo for him to give to his kid miles you know what i mean like and it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a timeless it's not rap it's not like yo bro listen to my album it's right like, here. You, you want to check out this illustration of Billy Holiday, perhaps? And thirty dollars later, maybe you know you keep this, put this on your bookshelf. So yeah, we're just trying, trying to to do rap shit without being a rapper. I love it. <laughs> and shout out to Sky Zoo. I just found out about uh, his restaurant down there in Atlanta. So uh... yeah, yeah, yeah. Burger Bistro. I was there a couple weeks ago. They got the banging uh, lemon pepper salmon strips. Highly recommended. That sounds dope. And he's there working. He's 
grinding it out. He's the man, yo. He's That's one crazy. Of yeah, yo, the food food and beverage business is no joke. I salute anybody that makes this last. Shout out to my family restaurant. We had to close our doors two years ago. Father and son seafood. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, oh, okay. I, I, that's that's the restaurant. Okay, father and sons. Okay, I peeped that from Instagram. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh, I got you. Yeah, all the dots are connected. Now, I wish so. I could have eaten there, bro. Well, damn, bro. It's all good. Yeah, it come from a long line of restaurant tour history. Like uh, my pops Gee. is the first one to bring the Philly cheesesteak to Harlem. So like, man, damn. it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. But okay, yo, I love this. I love this convo, man. Um, back to the album Dimension Five, the wordplay and bar intent. Okay, so here's where we go back to giving Talib so he can redeem himself and get get some yeah. his flowers back because. The man does have his moments where he really is maybe the first to say some lines that we've heard other people use later on, but maybe the first. I think Talib does does a better job with wordplay when he's doing his lines not in obvious ways for you to get it, and I think his obvious lines is where he falls flat. So Yeah, okay. That's a great that's I a hundred percent agree with that. Yeah, I always call it the Red Man effect. You know, Red Man delivers his lines like, you better hear this. Like, yeah, I'm yeah, like, dude, yeah. please ride in the Fuji in the movie. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, then there's rappers that are just going to hit you like line by, for line for line. Like, Lupe doesn't care if you are going to catch these lines. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. But they're going to keep coming at you. And I always say the great rap effect is the more clever a rapper you are, you can get away with some lazy lines if it's sandwiched between two dope lines. Like Jay-Z. I mean, he's a master of that. Master. Just even the line, like, I'm not a businessman, I'm a businessman. That's like one right. of the greatest, most iconic, and it's 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 literally just, a, it's a sky hook. There's a little nothing just like, you. <laughs> it's definitely a sky hook. Yeah, I mean, Talib, he has lines like where he says, "Your firearms are too short to box with God." Right. Yeah, we've heard we've heard the arms too short to box with God line a ton of times, but he's the first one to your firearms, and he said that right Fire after making, he said that right after making a line about how people rely on their guns. Um, that's that's a great example. Lines like that are a lot more clever than be a visionary, and maybe you won't see your name in the column of obituaries. Like he wanted you to hear that line, but it just right maybe wasn't as clever as the firearms as short right, 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 right. It was a bigger word, though, and it was a more, definitely, like, a style, like, it was definitely a style of the time to, like, meticulous, ridiculous, like, yes. Crazy. So, that, I, think, I mean... <laughs> I think Slow the House or Eminem coined it as the lyrical miracle, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That that is the quintessential underground style. I was guilty of it in the '90s. Another thing that you had to do if you were an underground rapper is use words like verbal and lyrical. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of that on this album. Most and and Quali are guilty of it, but I think again because of Bose's character, his delivery, you don't notice it as much because he has whole sequences where he's just every word is rhymey, 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 and I'm like. Okay, but it all makes sense. I think Talib will rhyme stuff just for the sake of rhyming a lot of times. Right. Uh, and then he, he'll fall flat, like, because he's trying to rhyme, um, I think, A Thieves in the Night. He's desperate to get that, the bluest eye line out there, because that's I, what the song I was is. Just, I literally just typed <laughs> it up so I could reference that, because I just, I always thought that was so dope. Like, he's got, Tony Morrison and I was like you know getting introduced to those authors and those books at the time too um he looked at me he thought about it was like I'm clueless why <laughs> yeah <that was. laughs> you, you, you gotta be real specific and real confident and if you're gonna do a, a remainder I call it a remainder if you're gonna cross the bar line and yeah. carry it into the next sentence or it's gonna sound real amateur and sloppy and that's what it sounded like he's like Give me the fortune, not the fame, said my man Lewis. I agree. It was just yeah, it yeah, yeah. low. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah, that's the question yeah. was rhetorical. The answer was horrible. Our morals are out of place and God in the last full of sorrow. I 
I love this song. And, and okay, I didn't know as far as the wordplay that hook. Not strong, only aggressive. Not free, we only licensed. Not compassionate, only polite. Not the nicest. That I, I I read a, a little quick interview about that, and it was it, I think it's a Toni Morrison passage. Yeah, it's from the end of the book, and I'm like, oh, that's okay. genius. That's what I mean. That's the- incredible. Like, yeah, I mean, that's so dope. And like the wordplay, like them going back and forth, and then to flip it to only. Only polite. Now, who the nicest? And the ad right. lib, like, and like, nice on the mic, going with polite, like, whoo! I got a little yeah. goosebumps. Like, <laughs> it is, that shit still stands up. Twenty five years later, it's still gold, bro. Yeah, they. I mean, they're at their best when they go back and forth. But then, yeah, I, to to the point about Talib doing better with lines that he's trying to slip in there, as opposed to make the focal point. He does it again on Hater Players, where he says, I'm the MC these Spice Girls want to be. I'm like, oh, it's clever. You're playing off yeah. of the, the double yeah. entendre, right? Yeah. So if he had more moments like that, instead of really trying to drive the, the line home, it would have it would have worked. Uh, I think he would have had more shining moments. And his voice doesn't do him any favors because, yeah. I mean, even back in the day, you know, you, he's a love or hate as far as with his voice you know what i mean like yeah uh and and so it's just when, when you're already wordy and you're and you're already forcing the pocket with your with your lexicon and the, the voice isn't doing you any rhythmic favors or any like you know accidental magic you know like like a like the sean p you know like just it's like some old like you got something, you know, like Method Man always got, always tucking his teeth after every bar. Like just something natural about you, like, no matter what. Right. Yeah. Yeah, those are good points, man. I, I mentioned before that most gets in this poetic bag. I think about how he starts his verse on Hated Players. And you're expecting this to be the battle rap song. Talib is coming in full battle rap mode. He's talking to whack MCs. You suck like hickeys, which is a really pedestrian That's line. <laughs> but. But Moe comes in and he takes it somewhere else differently. He says, Visions occupy my synaptic space, command is shaped to illustrate my mind's landscape. And he proceeds to make that whole verse a metaphor about how his mind is like terrain. He makes all these references to land and air and sea. And then he ends it with some some more like kind of battle rap lines. Like, yeah, I'll leave you mumbling to yourself like a schizo. But, but it's not crazy because he's just telling you this is how dope my mind is. It's not too abstract where he's like right, messing right, up right. the theme of the song he's just like this is why you can't get with me because my mind is like a mountain with rivers flowing down it and streams <laughs> so uh, <laughs> they're doing all the devices they're using metaphor they use a simile they're using you know you mess around with most it's gonna be uh alliteration it's gonna be onomatopoeia <laughs> all that yeah and i love what you mentioned about Talib growing up in the bookstore, I know they they went back in, a few years later and saved that store from being closed by buying That's it out. Me. It made me, it opened my eyes to how much he references books all through it. Like he has a line where he's like, run through it like a river. He's oh yeah, be- I, I, bet, I bet if I listen right now, we find more shit just because, you know what I mean? Like, didn't know him at the time. Like, it's just constant. He's definitely yeah, it, in his bag with that. I think that leads him to make offbeat references that maybe matter to him, but not other people. Where he's like, they say I'm the one with the real music and lyrics, like Cyrano. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cyrano the that that? <laughs> That's that's such an obscure reference. Do you know that line? Can we break that down? I love yeah. to break that down. Cyrano de Bergerac is the exactly, reference. and it's some Fre- it's like a French play or some shit. Yeah. Um, and I remember studying it in high school, like in in lit class, like briefly. But it was basically a, a dude who was ugly and he had a fucked up face. His nose was all fucked up. He had got his shit cut off, and but he wanted this girl. So so he basically found this dude that was like handsome or whatever, and he was writing all this fly shit and feeding it to him. And then the, and then. Dude got the girl, but he tried to be like, nah, but I was the one that was writing this shit. I'm I'm 
I'm right. who you love. It's me. So the fact that he referenced that, like, yo, could be like you were paying attention in school. Like that's some he was like really on it. Because right. that's some shit that people were like students were rushing to forget. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. It's and then and he's it's like too, rapping about it. He's rapping about it and it shows you where he's coming from, but it's too obscure of a reference. And it's not Yeah, even, I, I would say I would say so. I would say so. But, and it's not even one of those that you have to rewind to be like, oh, I see the value. It didn't really connect. He's going to mention The Blue Side by Toni Morrison and Cyrano the Bird Jacket and yeah. stuff like that because it matters to him. So uh, what, what are you giving this on a scale from 1 to 5? Wordplay and bar and tent, maybe a 4.5. 4.5, nice. And let me no. just say, at, as the final, to put a pin in that, I think that Mostaf is able to do more with less in Talib. When he's not at his best, he's doing less with more. Fair enough. Record. Fair enough. Uh, another Dylan question. Okay, so this is another intersection kind of thing. How did you hook up with Diamond D, man? I, another wow. thing, another goal of mine with Plates and Crates was to... I was like, I can't have this name plates and crates and not get a digging in the crates member. So I, I had reached out to like showbiz to, to come to their studio and do a special edition. And shoot, I, I think I even hit up Fat Joe. But most recently, since we've been doing this show at For Rap Critic, I reached out to Diamond last year after I did my OC episode. So I finally got a digging in the crates member, not for plates and crates, but for this show. And, oh. um, I hit up Diamond right after, and I was like, Diamond, I know you work with a Plates and Crates. I was like, just don't want to confuse you. This is a different Plates and Crates. Ah. And, you know, when, when you speak to Diamond, tell him he played me. Shout out to Diamond D. He oh, no me. Yeah. <laughs> tell him, tell him, man, that's your people. Because he was like, bet, let's do it this Wednesday at this time. I totally started ignoring the messages after that. How'd you hook up with uh, Mr. D? Yeah, so, um, man, shout out to Diamond D. Uh, can't believe I've been knowing him for so long. I guess it was like 12 years ago, around 2009-ish. Um, I was living in this house, a big, like a house out in the Burbs, like big old, like Brady Bunch, like 70s ranch house. It literally looked like the Brady Bunch house. I live with this band called Collective Efforts. They're super dope. Shout out to Collective Efforts. And um, Diamond was coming around because um, there's a dude called Big X, who uh, is, a, is a DJ here. Shout out Coalition DJs. He got the strip club on lock, like, all over the world. But back in the day before that, he was in a group called Y'all So Stupid, which went on to become Mass Influence, which is, like, some 90s Atlanta boom bap, like... They, they, they worked at Fat Beats at the Fat Beats Atlanta store like this was like the embodiment of, of like the 90s Atlanta New York transplant everyone that came to go to school at Morehouse and all that Big X had done the, the beat called Den and It on De La Soul oh wow so so based off of that relationship like Diamond really fucks with oh, Big wait. X he used to call himself Spearhead X right Spearhead X Correct. Yeah, the we, we, I remember that from our, our Stakes is High episode. That's there it is. All right. So Spread X, he's the man. And, and so he was he brought around Diamond. And I had my little studio upstairs, and Diamond would come over to the crib. Um, I'd always like geek out and like not want to bother them, but like kind of listen. Like, oh y'all, oh y'all need some weed? I got some weed. Like, oh. <laughs> and just from there, like one day I just heard a knock on my door and it was diamond and he was like yo i like i like your sound in here like i like what you got going on like can you help me out with some engineering i can do some beats for you and i was like yes and that's how we did our first project um that was called black tie fair um we probably started that in like 2013 it just took a long time for it to get finished it came out in 2017 it took mad long uh, uh so that's that's the first record we did together. And I, I've engineered and worked on like pretty much every one of his albums since we met, starting with the Dime Piece One, um, 
I was on the Dime Piece 2 on the song with Afro and Twista, which is insanity. That was crazy that he gave me that look. Um, and yeah, I've been really blessed to be able to, to kick it with Diamond and call him a friend. You know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. It's crazy. He's the man. He's a B-boy to the core. So hold on. You're telling me that you did not seek out a Digging in the Crates member. You just happened to have an event called Plates and Crates. And, and seriously, just a knock at your door <laughs> puts you in line and in concert with one of the founding Digging in the Crates members. Like, you can't ask for a better story. Yeah, no, and what's wild is I'd have to think, I don't think I had Plates and Crates at the time. Okay. I definitely didn't. Nor did I have full plate even, because I've been knowing Diamond for, for a, quite a minute. But either way, that's still crazy. <laughs> that is, is super crazy, dude. Like, <laughs> what a story. Yeah, shout out to Diamond D, man. Yeah, in, uh, in, in Tucker, Georgia, in the burbs of Atlanta, like, of all places, bro. Like, you just never know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny where it, like, takes you. But I look at things like that as validation that you're supposed to be doing this, right? Or else those things wouldn't happen. Uh, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like <laughs> yeah, man. If... Only reason I still mess with rap, besides, you know, having that in, internal belief that I'm nice, is there's been so many dope moments. Like, it's like, oh, right. my name's on the cover of a book now for being a rapper. My name is, you know, like, I, I teach classes. I do, it's like, oh, those moments, yeah. okay. Back to the album, Dementia Six. This is the overall quotability. And I usually separate this in two, two pockets, punchlines or poetic wisdom. And I do that because most rappers don't do both. I think this album is it leans heavier towards the poetic wisdom, like things to put on a t-shirt, things to quote, than punchline. Yeah. Your, your punchlines are gonna come uh mostly from the guests, which ironically, shout out to Wordsworth. I was supposed to uh, do something with him uh during the pandemic, but Wordsworth, I, I always thought that that duo was weird because Wordsworth always had more punchlines to me than punchlines. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's hilarious. And, and Wordsworth comes off with some of the most clever lines. Like he said, in a Sony, Iowa, I fit all stereotypes. I'm like, bruh, bars, right? Then he goes, he said something like, in a rhyme bout, you need to dial nine just to get a line get out. Get a line out. But that's so simple. It's like low hanging fruit. It's like, oh shit, I wish I said that. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's so but, dope. Like, but because his verse is what it's like what eight bars and each of his lines are like that he's right. killing it and that's what i mean about it. you can get away with simple stuff if you keep it coming you don't give him a minute to breathe it's like a good comedian four like basic jokes in a row sound funnier than when that basic joke is your whole shebang right <laughs> and, and and on the on the knowledge tip you know songs like knowledge to self-determination there's a lot of mm -hmm jewels you can take from it and just the fact that they were turning a tony morrison book into a whole rhyme like it's not just the hook because most takes it a step further and breaks down the hook on his verse right he's like yeah, not strong that's, that's because we do the good not polite yeah, we... dog incredible it's one of my favorite songs like of all time and definitely from that era and i think that's yeah. an exemplary song of the of that style of of like that upper level backpack conscious rap i guess although I, there was like a brief moment in time when i probably felt like yeah conscious rap i like that and then it was like yeah. oh, wait a minute nah that ain't right i think yeah. common ruined it. Ruin it for us <laughs> 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 that's hilarious yeah i say that about the thing about the bush babies mr man being one of the more low-key he was that rapper yeah. from the group that didn't really you know, you had um, my man the, who did the patois. He had his own thing that he brought. Right. To it, but it, was, it was Lee Majors that was like going for the punchlines, right? He's like, I learned the facts of life from Mrs. Get. Like, he's going more for that. If I'm the understudy of the less dynamic member, I'm probably taking some of those elements uh, with me. And I think that's right. different. And, and most used to run with them too. So I imagine, you know, most takes more of the from the dynamic, like I'm more the everybody. Right, right, right. <laughs> so yeah, um, could, could do both. And he figured that out. 
Exactly. And I would give the record a four, well, only because maybe it gets a little complex and maybe a little too wordy where it's just hard to follow. So then uh, another Dylan question. Let's get to the, the new project, right? Uh, Uncut Gems. Yeah, baby. What is the biggest difference between Uncut Gems and Black Tie Affair? That's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so for Black Tie Affair, it probably, I would say it's more polished. Um, Production-wise, the beats are more polished. And the songwriting even, like what I was trying to do, like I was very conscious that it was the Diamond D produced project. And so I was trying to like kind of write to like live up to that expectation um, with the songs and and um, maybe not take as not taking as many risks, you know, but just trying to like just do the job, keep it clean, you know, button it up, black tie affair. Where uncut gems um, is def is definitely like more of my take of like, well, first of all, I can say that some of the beats are from like ninety eight. 02, 04. I got like some lost diamond beats that were dumped off the machine. A couple of them. There's a variety. Some are more recent, but some are, and you'll hear them, they're like straight from the era. And so that was kind of like loosely like, oh, these are like, these are rough diamond joints. Like, some of just kind of just like popped up. Um, and I would say it's got more of like a brawlic, like hip hop. Like, lyrically, I'm being a lyrically lyrically I'm, I'm a little more maybe aggressive like maybe not you know taking the gloves off a little bit and being like you know whereas black tie affair i had to come into the door and you know take my jacket off now i'm taking my shoes off in this motherfucker you know what i mean like getting nice. comfortable with it um and then it's a it's more of a full album so it's nine tracks so basically me and diamond like all right let's let's follow up let's let's do a full joint let's let's make it a whole album um, so, so we can get the full spectrum, you know what I mean? So there's a little more room to breathe and, and stretch out than the first project. That's probably why I had to be just like, okay, we we got to just knock these joints out. They got to have the up-tempo joint, got to have the introspective joint, got to have the story, and then that's it. We don't got no room for nothing else. <laughs> well, you know, in this one, um, more room uh, to spit, really, and just kind of talk my shit. <laughs> yeah, and you just filmed the video for the first single. Yeah, yeah, we we, we had two shoots. Uh, we had a listening party um, and a shoot at, at a spot called Patchwork, uh, which is an iconic Atlanta iconic. studio. And it's crazy because, um, shout out to my man New Bass, who's like the hip, he's the hip hop hoarder. He's the nostalgic master of the magazine tape. Yeah. He's, he's that dude. Um, he was there and he was like, yo, he like kind of stopped everybody. He was like, yo, um, cause I was playing the song with Razcast. Raz is on the album, shout out to Razcast. And he's like, yo, this ain't the first time that they play some Diamond D and Razcast in this building. He was like, the uh, very first uh, yes, yo, it was in so 1995 yeah. and it was for Soul on Ice. And Diamond's jaw like dropped and he was like, nah. And, and the new face was like, yeah, I know you did the beat. You mixed the beat out in California, but y'all came here and mixed the vocals. He was like, you right. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy for that to come like full circle and for him to have that moment and for us all to be there. And then like, boom, here's here's another Razzcast joint, you know, being bumped in the halls of Patchwork. Um, so Yo, yeah, that, that, was, that was really dope. Yo, I love listening to your stories because it's like how it all comes together. It's so, it's like serendipitous but organic at the same time. So, man, yeah, bro, it's yeah. it's crazy. It's like it speaks on what you were talking about earlier. Like sometimes you be having these moments, like, well, I guess I'm supposed to be doing this. Otherwise, like, why would this happen? Like, like in this way, like, just keep going, just keep going forward. And yeah. you'll know, actually have the. Uh, Got the record right here. There it is. There it just go. came in yesterday. Ah. Uncut gems. Vinyl, and that's that's full plate vinyl right there, right? Yeah, baby. Yeah, it's awesome. With the translucent gem blue. So yeah, the, the record comes out uh, Tuesday, June sixth. We do Tuesday releases at full plate. That's how we doing it. 
Um, it's all produced entirely by Diamond. Um, Diamond's rapping on it too. I made sure to get him to spit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We got the rally towels. We got L's Eye on the album. Uh, nice. That single went live yesterday. He's one of my absolute favorite MCs. I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I've always rocked with the Detroit scene and always been a fan. So it's crazy to have L's Eye. Uh, I said we got Raz Cats on a song with Planet Asia, another one of my all time favorites. Like, nice. talk about unsung heroes of rap and just like, just never kick the whack verse rappers. Like, yo, Planet Asia. Yo, um, and you got. You got Slim Kid Trey on there. You got Slim Kid Trey from the far side, uh, which is crazy. Um, just because another one of my all-time favorite uh, songs, She Said, from Lab Cabin, one of my favorite albums. Like, I just can't believe I got Slim Kid on a joint. With Stacey Epps on the hook, who I've been friends with for mad years. She was on my first album. Um, it just It's so dope to watch the moves she's been making. She's like everybody's lawyer and she she brokered the black star deal for the album so she's like dave chappelle quali mad libs she's running she's repping them and, and so it's it's just dope to see like everybody like branching out and doing all their grown up we're of a certain age now but then still got time to come in the booth and and, and spit some shit and drop some shit that's you so dope. You're, you're so connected. You make me want to jump back in the rap bag again. Cause I'm like, yo, it's it really it's just a matter of doing it, right? That's um, it, it really is. I'm just I'm just around, bro. I'm just around. That's all. I just I just keep showing up. I'm that dude that keeps showing up to work. Like <laughs> Okay, so Dimension Seven, uh, the concepts. Uh every good classic album usually has a conceptual song if it's not a concept album itself. Um, this album I don't think is, a, is considered a concept album, but do we have any songs on here where they're taking you into a space where you have to think creatively, abstract even, or, or just from a different angle? If we really talk about some like creative listening, respiration, probably. Uh, That's what I was going to say. I mean, the way those lyrics are so vivid, like the, the new moon rose high in the sky at a metropolis. That's just like, bro, like right off the fucking bat dog like I, all right i'm in i'm here for this like he's picking the picture that yeah like respiration like the city breathing like they stick to it and like even speaking of spanish like give bringing that like spanish harlem like that new nyc like little flavor like yeah the, like the the city's not a woman she's a sexy fucking rosie perez <laughs> whispering in your ear type of woman you know what i mean right. like like She's a Rosario like, Dawson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah like, you know, be like, that's that shit. It, it, even Thieves in the Night, I feel, is a, a great concept because it's a, a it's a literary concept. Like, and they stuck yeah. to it and brought right. a book to life and turned a book into a song. I, I, I think maybe yeah, it's maybe more unconventional concepts. Um, even the B Boys will be B Boys because they basically turn it into a jam. And turn it into like a live album real quick and use like yeah. in the I, cycle. I always, I always break it down by probably like your more solid concepts and your loose concepts. So I would say like B Boys will be boys and um a children's story, those are loose. Right. Wow. Thieves in the night and respiration are definite concepts. Like yeah, they, yeah, like, sticking with you, sticking the and, and they the strength in that is a lot a lot of times we see rappers attempt it and lose it they stayed on task the whole time especially a song like respiration everyone understood the assignment the poetic yeah. description of the city never wavers like yeah. common stays on thing even it, he's his verse he's talking more about like the loss of his friend but also the city and he ends it by comparing his man breathing to the, to the city breathing i'm like oh he he, he took it home he understood it so right. if, if you're saying most Starts it off with the new moon shine high on, on top of the metropolis, and then we're ending it with I heard the city breathe. I'm like, yo, they got it. That's beautiful, beautiful descriptions, man. Yeah, it's one of my all time favorite songs. And yeah, then like that song will never get old to me. And like we pointed out with Thieves in the Night, like, uh, you know, Talib's 
let you know where, where he's going with this. We're living by the law of the blue side and mm -hmm. most break it down even further. Here's why we're not strong. Here's why we're not free. Blah, 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 blah. They, they don't like, waver. If any of them would have deviated and started battle rapping in the middle or bragging, it would have killed Yeah, them. they would have lost it. They would have lost it. You're showing us why you're an artist and not a rapper. So I think we hit it on the nose. I think they got a fair amount of loose and solid concepts. What would you give this on a scale from one to five? Uh, 3.5. Just because there's not enough body of work. I feel like if there was a couple more songs, they probably would have been concepts. That would have wow. got it. You're a harsh critic, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're winding down. We're at the home stretch. Uh, what's your favorite song of Black Tie Fair? And what's your favorite song of Uncut Gems? You know, I, I'll probably say uh, of Black Tie Fair is probably the song called Let the Horns Blow. I was yo, I was just about to say that's my favorite joint. <laughs> oh, that's good looking out. You know, that's it's funny because um, obviously that's the Jungle Brothers loop. Um, and I was like nervous about rocking it. But I was like, well, Diamond D put it together. Like, if anybody, if anybody's allowed from a producer standpoint to like touch something that's been touched, like Diamond's one of those dudes. Like, so I was like, all right, it's just, it's too fun. And I come from like the B Boy era and like DJing B Boy jams and hosting like B Boy jams and like rocking like up, up tempo shit. So for me, it's just like, yeah, let me just, let me rock this up tempo shit. Um, so that's kind of the vibe for that. And I like that I'm, it's just like, whatever. I'm just rapping about whatever. I'm just bragging. It's, yeah. it's fun to do live. All right, weird. what's your favorite off of Uncut Gems? Uncut Gems. Um, there's a joint called Turn the Heat Up that I think is is it's just, it's, it's real straightforward, just bars, slick talk, nothing over the top the beat is crazy to me it's like super in the pocket it's like a crazy slick loop like and i got the funky cuts on there i do all the scratches on the records um so that's probably my favorite joint so when it comes out on the six check for that turn the heat up nice. yeah that's the one coming out swinging with elzai to me is crazy elzai absolutely bodied it you think he bodied you on it? I hate that. Oh, hate yeah, that. of course. What can I... I knew what I was getting into. I knew what I signed up for. I I held my own. I think I held my own. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the judges was, was scored, you know, uh, you know, it might be. be. <laughs> but I knew what I was getting into because it's a it's a concept. The song is a concept, like just boxing, because Diamond's super into boxing. Like, he's heavy in the boxing. A lot of New York cats, they like boxing and shit. I'm from down yeah, south. Yeah. Like football, I used um, to box. Yeah. Oh, no <laughs> doubt. See, yeah. Don't, I, I don't. My my so, lungs is too short to hot box with God. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that that would be a concept. You're telling me y'all are both doing a brag rap song, but within the context of boxing. Yeah, that's coming out swinging. Yep. Yeah. Well, but it's 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 pretty dialed in, um, and just Elza just absolutely just sticks to the concept. Like every bar, every. He just he does tears that. Apart and rebuilds it. He's the he's the man, yo. He does that because I remember on the track with uh, Drake and Fonte, the whole tr song was he took that "Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover" thing literally. His whole verse is like rapping as a book or rapping to a book or something like that. Dude, he's he's an absolute surgeon. He's a he's a one of one in my book. Huh? Yeah, incredible. Definitely underrated. Um, Back into the album combo, I put these dimensions together. It's dimension eight, the externalized content, and dimension nine, the internalized content. So basically, how much topical stuff are they touching on outside of their inner self and outside of their autobiography, like government, politics, women, and then um, internal, of course, is the opposite of that. Their, their emotions, their life story stuff. How much of that are we getting on this album? I think pr probably damn near, I would give probably four, I would give like f at least a four for each. I think they kind of embodied both sides, like that album and them as artists, especially for the time, kind of embodied, like we're going to touch on 
the government, injustice, misogyny. We're going to touch on that's like external, political, you know, crime in the city, all the shit, racism, all that. And then at the same time, like, I used to have a complex about getting too complex. Right. Like, personal, there's like the personal, you know, um, mantras and stuff. Yeah. And I think they were, I think that just comes from like their dedication to like using their lyrics. Like, every word holds power, each word holds weight, and each word on the album counts. You know what I mean? And, and, and so, yeah, I, I would say heavily, heavily. Yeah. It's the four for each. If I break it down, I'm thinking those four songs that I mentioned that are like the quote unquote battle rap songs, uh, definition, redefinition, hate of players, and twice in a lifetime. Every other song outside of that is on a definite topic, right? So from the moment the album starts and they come in with astronomy, they're letting you know that this is about third eye vision and right, 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 right. which is popular kind of woke talk back then, right? It's a little right, bit for of that. Sure. A little bit of that five percent stuff, a little bit of that Afrocentric stuff. Right. They kind of put it all together. But then that whole song is like creative ways to talk about blackness, right? Black like this, black like that. Yeah. And so That's it's so, Yeah, I'm forgetting that. That's so dope. Moses verse black like my granddaddy's arm chair. He never really got much time to chill there. Right. Life was warfare. I was like, oh my God. Like yeah. bro, what? So, <laughs> instead of right. like instead of any expository songs here where they're like here's my life story they give it to you in pieces like lines like that right yeah um, yeah, yeah yeah knowledge of self-determination is just that brown skin lady is just that and so on and so forth and even even hater player is that kind of like a diss to the jiggy era like kind of like yeah like so there's like you know it's it's still like a, a underground righteousness type of which i Super duper fucks with. <laughs> yeah. At the time? Oh man, at the time. Okay, so you said a oh, four yeah. for both. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, final Dylan question. You said what your favorite joint is. I was gonna say something about the Fim Fatale song. I have a transition for that though. I can I can help out with that. So on this album, because uh, we actually picked all the beats out in like one day. Uh, it was kind of an ill process. Shout out to my dude DJ Kerosene who's the Atlanta Boom Bap ambassador. Um, uh, it was Carol's birthday, and me, Diamond, and Carol were all kicking it. Uh, we went back to my crib, we're chilling, whatever. Dime just starts playing beats. Uh, and I was like, yo, what's up with this beat? And he's like, well, it's open. What you think about it? And I was like, oh shit, you're in that kind of mood. And I was like, all right, I was like, all right, well, let's keep listening. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. So one of the beats that we heard, we like kind of picked the beats out and concepted them like right there. It was like, oh, this beat can be this beat. This beat will be this. This beat will be this. So one of the joints was, my man Carol was like, yo, this sound like a prelude to Femme Fatale. Like, like, uh, yo, like this when you met first met the chick, like before Femme Fatale, like this is how, you, this is some shit y'all got into beforehand. I was like, yo, it's kind of ill. So, so you got a prequel? <laughs> yeah, it's a prequel on it's called Devil in a Blue Dress. And nice. it's not and I, I quote the movie, um, you know, the Denzel shit. It, it, yeah, it, 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 if you're in the world and you've seen the Femme Fatale shit and you're like in that universe, you could like put it together that that's a prelude. But you don't have to know Femme Fatale to appreciate this song. It's just a story rap. I, I typically always have at least one story rap on every project. Yo, I try that's, and a, that in. that's a perfect segue, y'all. I appreciate you so much because that's the final dimension, dimension 10, the storytelling because the older Dodge is it's not a classic album if there's not one good story. One, do you believe in that? And two, what can we say about the storytelling on Black Star? Damn, it's not a classic album unless there's one good story. I might have to agree to that for my personal taste as a lover of lyrics and a lover of storytelling. Um, yeah, I might have to agree with that because typically in storytelling, you're allowed either some aspect of comedy or some as just some other device that takes it over the top from just the song into like permanently in your brain. Um, 
and I think the storytelling on on Black Star album is pretty great. Um, Respiration to me is a story. Um, like to me, it's like just one of the that and Thieves in the Night. Is that a story? Nah, probably not. Not really. Talib starts his verse off in a narrative format, but then it goes right, right. But it it doesn't go. It doesn't stick with that. But I would say Respiration is a story. Um, obviously, children's story is a story and a great one. Um, I would give it a four. I would give it a four for storytelling, because even like, even their 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 presentation of the culture, of the underground culture, is almost like they're telling you a story. It's almost like they're telling you a story of like what it's like to go to Brooklyn and go to Union Square Park or whatever, mm-hmm. being a cipher and like to hear the the. It just felt like that to me, being from where I'm from too, like from the country, from Jacksonville, from like everything just felt like this world that I was immersed in. It just felt like the story to me, not being from New York. I could see people being from New York, not not resonating with it in the same way as it's more like their everyday life. Uh, yeah, that's 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 me. I'm like, okay, right. you're getting real philosophical with it, Dylan, but I can see it. I can see it. So, <laughs> Uh, on the on the straight up story tip, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I'd say a children's story, obviously, and maybe less obviously, less inspiration because it's not yeah. uh, it's not an ABC linear story. Each of them are telling like vignettes of city life. Right. So, okay, you said a four for that, and with that, that concludes our category two breakdown and analysis of the classic mm-hmm. album turning twenty five years old this Great. year. Most Def and Talib Kweli are Black Star. Um, I had to bring in a fellow lyricist, a fellow pro to do it. And I mean, it's great occasion because you you get the meeting of plates and crates. Finally, two halves <laughs> of the yeah, same Yeah, I love it. I love it. And uh, listen, man, it's, it's, it's really been a pleasure. We, we broke the rules. I did a Category 2 episode before I did a Category 1, but it all coincides with the release of Uncut Gems. Can you uh, can you tell the people where they can find you and what you got cooking next? Yeah, okay. Yeah, but my last name fucking sucks, and uh, it's a pain in the ass. And I when I when I got all my handles, I didn't think about you know I didn't think about social media. I'm not from that shit, so I just put my name, and that was the really fucking stupid thing to do. So if you have time and you and you're so inclined, it's Dylan D I L L O N. Mauer rhymes with power. M A U R E R. There's an extra fucking R in there because German people are very. Have you found a lot of people to spell your name like you? You're the first person I've seen named Dylan who spells it the way your parents. Oh, D I L O O N. Yeah. Look, this is the this is the this is the correct way. I don't know what y'all <laughs> do on it. Y'all out here dialing on it. You need to be Dylan it. You know there what I'm saying? You go. And, and I'm, I'm glad, I'm, glad I'm the I and not the Y. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow. Yo, the, point that. That's, that's, that's for you. I, there you go. That's, that. that's going to be the hot take that I used for the trailer of this episode. So people the I and not the Y. And, and <laughs> I'm going to start a Dylan beef worldwide. <laughs> I love it. I already got like 10. <laughs> hilarious, man. Well, I, keep, I keep Dylan beefs around. Yo, it's, it's the only way to go. Listen, he put it on a shirt. Uh, can they go cop that shirt? Yeah, I got a couple of these on the site. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of gear. Everything's at fullplatefam.com. Fullplatefam, F-A-M, like full plate family. Fullplatefam.com is the website. That's where the catalog's at. Um, we got like 30, 30 albums under the belt keep them going strong records cassettes flower pots <laughs> and matches apparently matches oh yeah you can uh i don't know if this qr code will work freeze frame on that baby stream the album i'm on all the dsps and all copies of the uncut jazz album come with a pack of matches for whenever inspiration strikes Dude, ah. uh- don't be surprised if you guys see me link up with Dylan and, and to help me market some new merch for for, for rap critic. Because yeah. <laughs> I mean, your mind is working. 
So it, he put his name on a shirt. Uh, uh, this is my shameless plug station identification reminder that you can go cop the I Used to Love Her t-shirt on ratruler.com. That's well, where you, okay. can also, you can also leave your votes for this album in every dimension that we just covered here. So you all, as a global hip-hop community, can decide how classic this classic is. It's the Rotten Tomatoes of hip-hop. Y'all already know what it is. Until next time, F for Rap Critic. They talk about it while I live it. Word to meth. That's love. That's love. Yo, F for Rap Critic, baby. 